not very many. Well, that's how I got started on this. I had a rat trap and my daughter dobbed me in. And uh, this uh, thing down here got little question marks on it. This is the wish list of uh, the Econet group, which uh, is doing uh, rat traps and weeds. I didn't realize weeds were such a problem. And actually, they're much more complicated than some of the other predators we've got. So this is a, a very large thing. So I've been dragged into it because I converted their rat data set from Ecotrack, which closed down, to uh, catch it. Well, no, Trap New Zealand. Catch it's a, an Australian uh, university one. And uh, they also want to uh, link into iNaturalist, which is another uh, weed application. And uh, they also want to link it into their council system. So it started off uh, as a simple thing to, to uh, do my rat trap. And then I've gradually got more and more uh, dragged into it. So it's a very large system. Um, and I'm this little bit down the bottom was saying, could we do this a little wish list? Let's just do that then. Right. <coughs> so one of the applications they've got is uh, this thing for STAMP, which stands for Stamp Out All Moth Plants, which is a serious problem in Auckland. And they've got this uh, CAMS weed application. Uh, and here's the uh, uh, distribution of, wheat, of, of uh, moth plants at the moment. And every purple point has to be reinspected because you might pull them out once and dob it, but you've got to go back the next year and see if it sprouted again because there's so many weeds from the moth plants. And uh, there is a weed app. See the little diagram there? So people can walk around and collect information about the weed apps. This has been going uh, quite a few years now, uh, and they want to uh, make it a bit better. So one of the things is the, it was in a, a thing called EcoTrack, and uh, they got uh, tired of it. So they've put it onto the cloud now. So I've got this thing about the cloud. Um, so I've got all these open source tools we're all using, but the problem is the server on the cloud is not free. So there's a bit of a hole in our system. We've got all this free open source uh, software, open source data, and uh, open source consultants, and free consultants, because I'm doing all this for free for, for the web apps. But if we look at the, I've got these three clips out of the paper, Microsoft, this is their, their uh, server that they're building in Auckland, and it's costing 100 million. And uh, just to beat that, Amazon have come along and said, oh, but we're spending seven and a half billion in New Zealand in the next seven years. And Google topped that and said, but we're creating a thing which is going to have 46 billion in economic value by 2030. So I'm looking at this money and thinking, who's paying for this? Because the users are not, they're all using the internet for free, aren't they? So it must be us. We're going to have to pay this. And it's quite a lot, really. So, so one of my problems is with free and open source software is that we've been sort of gazumped by the servers. So we're all paying an awful lot of money to use our free software in the cloud. And this is a problem for me. I had a go uh, during lockdown at using Amazon AWS and S3. And I'm terribly impressed with those uh, Linz guys who've, who've cracked it because I found the roles and the whole process absolutely appallingly difficult and amazingly expensive. I was going to put up some data that people wanted to use FTP. They were going to use uh, FME to download it with an FTP uh, call. And I realized that having it sitting there each month doing nothing was going to cost me hundreds of dollars when they only wanted to download it once a month. So I put it on my server in my office and, and did it. But uh, these numbers look absolutely ridiculous, but actually if you take the 46 million and say it's 50 million and divide it by the number of people, it actually only comes out at $1,000 per head. So actually it's not quite as bad as it looks. Uh, so, but nevertheless, someone's going to be paying a lot to use our free software. So this, uh, back to the, the uh, Econet thing. Uh, on the left here, this is what happened at the beginning. Someone volunteered. Uh, to do a system to set up. 
and they still need to put on the cloud, so they're going to pay somewhere. And uh, they designed the application, and they had to do a separate mobile application, and uh, there was not much funding support. They had to do their own interfaces and things. And eventually, uh, the designer moved on. He got tired of it, wasn't paying, no one else used it, and so the organisation got stranded with this uh, EcoTrack thing. So that's where I came in. Could I help move it from the old system into another system? So uh, the one that they chose was because their sponsor was using ArcGIS Online. And th the neat thing about it is that it is free for environmental groups. Now, if you go to ESRI and say, we're an environmental group, ESRI will say, oh, well, that's very good. You can have the software for free. So that's fine. In fact, uh, they've taken uh, not quite a free one. They've bought a, uh, an eco hub thing, which costs a bit more. But nevertheless, it's still free. And of course, it has all these advantages of advanced mapping, storage, the cloud, GitHub, open APIs, interface to the sponsors, GIS, that's pretty useful. Uh, and it also keeps up with technology. They've got all sorts of new things coming along, scheduled tasks, web hooks, and uh, multiple users and interfaces. All of those things are pretty hard to set up, unless you're Linz, of course, they know how to do it. So here's uh, the thing on ArcGIS Online. So I, I've, I'm not used to this. I'm used to uh, having things on my desktop and having absolute control. I set myself up as admin and I don't have any issues of, of access rights and problems and roles. I'm it. I can do anything I like on it. I know it's very dangerous, but that's how you work. Uh, uh, systems and it's a giant object model a and the thing about it is it's sort of no code environment so the the uh, econet people who are not computer savvy they can sit there with the GUIs and things like that and they can set up almost everything by themselves uh, so it's got all of these extra functions come for nothing uh, offline mobile replication synchronization multi-user change tracking editor roles other roles and things like that. That's a lot of work to set up, as I found when I tried to set up Amazon. So all this is just, you know, you can have it for, for nothing. Uh, and uh, we've got this uh, weeds location layer, and they now want to make it a bit more sophisticated by having a visits table. So you need to visit the same location several times. So the obvious thing is to have a one-to-many database, isn't it? So you've got multiple visits for one point, and you've you can link it all together, and we're all using SQL and databases. So this, of course you want to do that. So the, the guys had a look, and they said, oh, yes, this is, you can have a parent, uh, you can have one to many. And so here we've got our weeds points, and then we've got our visit tables. So they, they made it up. Uh, and uh, we need to just wash our mouths out a bit. It's not one to many. It's a parent child. Is there any difference? I'm afraid it's a lot of difference. One is a relational database thing, and that works fine. A parent-child means if you want to look at the child, you've got to ask the parents. You can't just go tickling up, giving kids uh, little sweeties and things. So here we've got our location data that's related to the point, and over there we've got our visit data, multiple visits, and the visit date, which is important. And they're all linked together by a global ID and a GUI ID, and this is because we need to replicate it across the internet, across multi-users. It's not, you don't have control of the keys. So I said, oh, yeah, well, that's okay. And of course, what they want to do is they want to put uh, the latest status on the map. Now, the trouble is the map can only be symbolized from the parent table. You can't symbolize it from a related table. So this is uh, one of the rules of GIS that we found. And I said, oh, what Python best they oh, I'm to the rescue, no problem. I'll, I'll just do it in Python and you'll have the thing there. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, this proves absolutely scientifically that the world is flat. You cannot have related multi-user one-to-many tables. You must have a single table to display the world, so that proves the world must be flat, must be a flat table. So there's no related tables, there's no child tables, there's no one-to-many relationships. 
you have to denormalize it to run any statistics. And you can only symbolize or analyze the flat table layer, therefore the world must be flat. So this is a bit of a disappointment to me and to the, the, um, the cloud internet view. So here we've got this REST API and it's open, that's great. I thought, that, well, how, how, how hard can this be? And it's available on GitHub and uh, you can install it with a pip env or uh, Esri like to use Conda because it's got more scientific modules built into Python. And uh, there are a whole lot of modules. The only modules I'm interested in is the GIS and the features. The rest of it, well, well done, but uh, that's no interest to me. Uh, and the, the GIS one is the main one that handles all the admin, the roles, the groups, the users, the OAuth, the logins, all of that stuff, which is a real pain. This is just uh, squashed down to GIS open home. And that's all you have to do. That's great. So it looks you up, works out your roles, and you don't have to do anything else in your Python script other than to say, log me in, here I am. And it also uses a lot of scientific libraries, and the one that I eyes lit up was Pandas Data Frame. Like Alex, who introduced me to Pandas, I thought, well, that's good. There's Pandas there. And they've extended it for spatial columns. So we've got Pandas with a geometry column at the end, and we can do intersects, unions, and all the spatial stuff inside Pandas. So forget all this API. I'll just use Pandas. It also supports Jupyter Notebook, so that's great. And we can use a virtual environment and it's got some community support. That means other users. They are great because they are the ones that are going to moan about the bugs and the things like that. So when I looked up the thing there, here it was, I found actually that the layer is now a feature layer collection. And there's a, a few things in there and that uh, then goes to a feature layer uh, which has a thing called a query and query related records. That's the thing I'm looking for. And the queries come down to a feature set. And inside the feature set, see there's a data frame there. Hooray, that's where I'm going to get my pandas data frame. And finally, you get down to attributes and fields right at the bottom, where I want to transfer from the visit table onto the weeds location. And there's one uh, extra thing I've highlighted up there in yellow, which actually isn't in the documentation. It's a new function which has been put in, which I really wanted, which I didn't know was there because it's not in the diagram because all the documentation is automatically generated from the API code on GitHub and it doesn't draw this diagram. But I used this diagram to see what I could do. So unfortunately, the, really, the useful thing I really wanted has, is an afterthought. So anyway, to start off, I had to scrub this data. So the obvious thing was to download it, which I can do with a, a, a click. Well, it uh, zips it up and downloads it. So here's a, a standard uh, ArcPy on my desktop. And uh, the basic thing is I've got two tables. I can now see the both tables. Uh, I've got the relates. I know how it relates together. Uh, and uh, I can open up a list comprehension, which gets out all the visit data, it says visit date but it really means visit data, gets it all out. I can put it into a pandas data frame and then Alex can explain this last thing, idx equals group by, that gets out the latest visit. It's pretty cool, but it's pretty obscure. I, I don't think many people would know how that works except Alex. Uh, is Alex here? Where is he? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I found this, I have to admit, on, on uh, Stack Exchange on how to do this. I knew I could do it, but uh, I looked up Stack Exchange. So basically, this runs through the 24,000 odd records in two seconds, updates the data in two seconds. It's pretty cool and it was pretty straightforward. So I thought, well, I've, I've done that there. All they have to do is put it up in the cloud. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, no, I don't. It's not like that at all. So here's the same thing that I've put up in the cloud and I've just replaced the cursor functions with a REST call to go and get the records. Well, it turns out that that's actually not the way it works. The way it works is that you send off a REST request, which is a complicated function, which generates 
a JSON script, a JSON object. So it hides behind the fact it's actually a JSON object you're sending. So if you don't know what the JSON object should have been, uh, then it won't work. So the first part, log into ArcGIS, well, that's a pretty good, pretty cool. That gets rid of a whole lot of OAuth logging and everything like that's great. And then I can search for the layer that I want because remember there's a million layers there. Uh, and then I can run extract changes when I get it working. So that takes a filter where I can get out all the things that have changed because I'm running tracking on it. And then I can check whether it's less than the 2000 limit because one of the rules is if you ask for more than 2000 re uh, records, it truncates it. Oh, thanks. Because I don't know how many records there are going to be because we've got a one to many. So a record counts as a visit with its parent. Or there might be none, in which case I want to, to just drop out. But the reason I want to uh, drop out is I want to run this every hour or something and pick up all the changes that people are doing <coughs> and then dynamically update it. How much time have we got? Uh, two right. So there it is. Uh, and each of these yellow ones is a slow process. None of this two-second stuff. We're talking about 20 seconds, 30 seconds, something like that, which is why they want to limit you to 2,000. So uh, here's uh, my Jupyter notebook of that. And so I'm wondering, is this the right architecture? Well, of course, it's not. But um, you can't give everyone access to the main database. That would be a disaster, wouldn't it? And, and so I know you might all say to me, well, I wouldn't start from here if you want to go there. This is the Irish thing about asking directions to Tipperary. Uh, so I'm stuck with it there. So I've got it to work, but I'm not particularly happy with it. In the meantime, they've given me a wish list with even more things. Now that I've got the first part working, why not uh, be, be more ambitious? And so they want to show dynamically on the map which things need visiting to try and reduce that load of how many places to visit. So they're going to base it on the status of the thing and the last visit and the species. And there's a whole big lot of species and it's all different dates when they come out and things like that. So this is my next task is to implement this uh, table. So I said, well, give me a table and I'll program it up. And the table actually is uh, two pages long. So <laughs> I don't know. So really, uh, I've set the Python script up in a task scheduler and it runs periodically. Uh, originally, I was going to run it every night, but now that I can do the changes, so it'll find that, I can do it maybe every hour, something like that. Uh, the to-do list is getting bigger, but at least you've now got a flat table so people can do statistics, uh, make reports and things like that from it. Uh, and uh, it will then show the status and maybe we'll have a dashboard and things like that in the future. That's it.